And where would people get such precedence from about burning? Where? From the Khawarij at Nahrawan? Forget the Khawarij. They came much later. Where would you get a precedent about beheadings? Where would you get a precedent about assassinations? Where would these come from? You would find they came from the very day the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his family died. Do you know how many millions in this world are not told about what happened after the Prophet Muhammad died? Or, not just not told, it's glossed over where someone is not even allowed to discuss it. What happened after the Prophet Muhammad died is fundamental. Why? Because it's a root of terror, which we see in Islam until today. Firstly, the ruling authority, the caliph of the time, decides what? The caliph of the time decides that he's going to send out his henchmen. His henchmen, who are they? They are a group of people who a few years earlier had been the biggest enemies of the religion of Islam. People like Khalid ibn al-Walid, Mughira ibn Shu'bah. These originally were thugs who were enemies of this religion. They had a hatred for the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family. If there is any representative of the Shia community, then please come forward and take a seat next to me. If there is any representative, please come forward and be seated on my left hand side. So discussion may continue. Use that microphone. That microphone. Okay. Yeah, when we discuss. Okay. Now that the representative has come forward, can Everyone please be seated and show the utmost respect for this gathering, utmost respect for the masjid, and respect for the speakers today. Let's show that our communities are able to sit down and discuss in a civilized fashion. If a Muslim can sit down and discuss with an atheist, without losing his temper, without using foul language, then those who claim to be the followers of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam should be able to sit down and discuss in a polite manner and with utmost respect. We have a representative from the Shia community with us. The brother will be using this microphone on his left hand side. Do you need a, a motor, please? Yes, yeah. don't mind. Do you need me to come? Uh, no, you wait. Not. 
What will be ascertained now is as to whom the individual who has arrived, who does he represent, which clerics does he represent, which hawza does he represent, which marja' does he represent, does he represent the akhbari shia, does he represent the usuli shia. These things will be determined because if he does not represent any hawza or any clerics, because he has come to discuss conditions for the debate, then he will be dismissed. But if he has come representing an actual Hawza and a recognized institution like the Khoi Foundation or the Mahdi Foundation the, and other Shia foundations and institutions within the UK or anywhere else, then the discussions regarding uh, the conditions of the debate will continue. A few points regarding today's uh, gathering is regarding slogans. We do not want either Sunni or Shia to use any slogans. We know in the Sunni community we use the slogan Takbir, Risalat and Hedri. So those Shia who are unfamiliar of this should know that saying Hedri here is not strange for us. In our Masajid they do use Nare Hedri as can be seen in the Pakistani army that they use the Nari Haydri, uh, an army which is mainly composed of Sunnis. So from both sides we do not want slogans, this is not a gathering for slogans and at the same time we do not want anyone to insult or use bad language to any side. Also there is a security presence, there is a police officer here if people want to identify the police officer, they can ask for the identification of the police officer from the security team here. They will identify that police officer for you. So if there is any illegal act within the premises, uh, the people performing that act, it would not be looked at as to whether they are Shi a Sunni or Shia or Muslim or non-Muslim. They will be arrested. We know with regard to the background of this debate challenge, some people, Sunnis and Shia, may ask what is the purpose. I would like to say that from our perspective, in our Sunni hadith collections, what has been mentioned is that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إِذَا ظَهَرَتِ الْبِدَعُ Al-Khatib al-Baghdadi narrates this hadith that when innovations appear and my companions are insulted, then the scholar or the one who has knowledge must reveal his knowledge. So the purpose is not to convert Shia to Sunni. The purpose is not to convert to proselytize Sunnism. The purpose is Idharul Ilm to show the knowledge that we have regarding these issues which have been disputed for hundreds of years. So the purpose of today's gathering is in order to show our side of the aqidah and belief and as to what we believe regarding the Alul Bayt, Alayhimu Salam, what we believe regarding the companions Alayhi Muridwan. Also, what started this issue is the speech of Dr. Ammar Naqshwani from London, who was initially challenged to debate, but has not responded regarding that challenge and is not present here today. But it has been brought to our attention that Dr. Ammar and Yasir al-Habib do not represent many Shia institutions and academia. They do not represent some of the maraji of Qum and the scholars of the Shia in Iran and other places. So therefore, we would not make ad hominem attacks on all the Shia individuals or all the Shia clerics. But those clerics who were contacted within Birmingham mentioned to us 
specifically from the Imam Bara on Clifton Road and the Imam Bara in Smulit. The Imams of those places did mention to us that they are against debating and they are against the actions of Dr. Ammar. So someone may ask why do we want to debate those individuals or why have we challenged the Shia community? In response to this, I say, like I said to some journalists who contacted me also, that if the Shia community in large is against the insulting, open insulting of the Shaykhain, Shaykhain meaning Sayyiduna Abu Bakr Siddiq and Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu anhu and the wife of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam and other companions whom the Sunni community respect and hold in esteem, high esteem, then the Shia institutions have a responsibility to make, uh, declare their official opposition within the UK condemning Dr. Ammar, condemning Yasser al-Habib. If it is said that they have already done this, then it, from the recent speech of Dr. Ammar, this has not been made very clear to us. So from our perspective, this has not been made very clear. So therefore, the, the debate challenge remains. Now, what does this dispute stem from? And what do we look at in terms of this uh, dispute between the Sunni and the Shia? And I do not think, I do not think in the history of the UK, there has been a gathering like this. Is that not true? In the history of the UK or the Muslim community in the Western world, there has not been a gathering like this where we are openly discussing these issues. That if we look at the history of both groups, both groups have a different narrative regarding the history of the companions Ali Muridwan. The Shia narrative regarding the Alul Bayt Ali Musalam and the companions Ali Muridwan is different to the narrative of Ahl Sunnati Wal Jama'ah. This narrative starts from Al Imamatul Kubra, the appointment of Sayyiduna Ali Karamallahu Wajhaul Kareem as Al Khalifa to Bila Fasl according to the Shia, which means the representative of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his deputy after the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Bila Fasl meaning without a gap. This is the claim of the Shia community. Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah say the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not appoint any Khalifa Bila Fasl. This is the foundational dispute and what we call Al-Imamah, the concept of there being 12 Imams, 12 Imams, each one succeeding the other, from Sayyiduna Ali Karamallahu Wajhahul Kareem to Sayyiduna Al-Imam Al-Hasan to Sayyiduna Al-Imam Al-Husayn radiallahu anhuma from, from Sayyiduna Al-Imam Al-Husayn to Sayyiduna Zainul Al-Abideen from Sayyiduna Zainul Abidin to Sayyiduna Al-Imam Al-Baqir, from Sayyiduna Al-Imam Al-Baqir to Sayyiduna Al-Imam Ja'far Al-Sadiq, from Al-Imam Ja'far Al-Sadiq to his son Musa Al-Qadim, from his son to his son Al-Imam Ali Rida, to his son Al-Imam Taqi, to his son Al-Imam Naqi, and then to Al-Imam Al-Hassan Al-Askari, to Al-Imam Muhammad ibn Al-Hassan Al-Askari. Radiallahu anhum ajma'in. So the Shia believe that these 12 are the representatives of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Bila Fasl meaning they have been appointed from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at the divine command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah believe that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam left the determination of who will be Khalifa 
to the Ummah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam which is known as Ijma' and we believe the companions had consensus upon Sayyiduna Abu Bakr as Siddiq Radiallahu An and then we know the, the Shura, the consultation and the successorship of Sayyiduna Umar and then to Sayyiduna Uthman Radiallahu An and then the war, the civil war in the time of Sayyiduna Ali Karamallahu Wajhul Kareem um, we will have a, a, a short break with the Manqabat. I will be going up to discuss with the individual who has arrived. And then once finishing our discussion, we request everyone to remain seated. If people stand up, then this will cause disorder in the majlis. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Just to announce that our meeting has come to a positive conclusion. A debate will go ahead between both groups. Um, they have told us the details of the, the scholar on their side who, will, who has been chosen. The details will remain private for now. But there is a person who is representing the Shia community and they have also given us the conditions of the debate. I have the conditions in my hand. Also, we have selected we have selected representatives from both sides for communication because one of the main problems was a lack of communication that people were using social media in order to communicate. But now we have direct communication with the representatives of the Shia community and those two representatives, private representatives will discuss those conditions and a debate will be held in the future with a venue and a time and the recording of that debate will also be released. The subject will be discussed as well as all other extraneous factors involved in the debate. This is the announcement that I have promised to make and I would request the Shia uh, uh, sitting in the audience now to leave with uh, the person who came to represent them in order that we may continue with our gathering and we have announced this fairly and in the future we will announce the, the debate also. Jazakumullahu <laughs> khairan. I will continue with my speech in a short while. I would want to also mention that the Shia cleric Allah Yari, he, his representative is also present here, but we refuse to talk to him rather than hiding these facts I would want to mention in public. We refuse to talk to him because we already have a UK based cleric who has come forward for the challenge. So Allah Yari, you will be dismissed because you are an Akhbari Shia as well. You do not represent the majority of Shia and the, the, the specific Shia cleric who has come forward is an Usuli Shia who represents the majority of Shia and is UK based. So therefore the debate will, the priority is given to the UK based uh, Shia cleric who wants to debate face to face as opposed to privately. From the way the gathering has been conducted, we know that the lie that was spread that the, this meeting will cause bloodshed on the streets of Birmingham, violence and chaos. We know that whoever placed that rumor on social media is responsible. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. I was mentioning that both groups have a different narrative of the historical events of what took place, and generally speaking, some of the Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'a are unfamiliar of the books of the uh, Shia sect. When it comes to familiarizing ourselves with the with the books of the Shia, we must know that they have a book, the books known as Al Usul Al Arba'a, the four principal books which were compiled in the fourth century of Islam in the 300s. These books in, include the books of Al Kafi, uh, Al -Kafi by Muhammad bin Yaqub Al Kulaini, and there are other books like Man La Yahduruhu Al Faqihu and Tahdeeb al-Ahkam and al-Istibsar. These four are the foundational books of the Shia sect. 
in the Sun Ahl Sunnati Wal Jama'ah, we have the Siha Sitta, the title Siha Sitta, however, does not mean that all the ahadith within the Siha Sitta are authentic. This is commonly misunderstood by the Shia that they say that your six books, Siha Sitta, are all authentic. The Ahl Sunnati Wal Jama'ah use the term Siha Sitta to mean that the overwhelming majority of the hadith in these six books are authentic. Otherwise, we know in the Sunan of Ibn Majah, there are multiple ahadith which are weak, which are considered weak within the Sunan of Al Imam Abu Dawood and Al Imam Al Tirmidhi. There are a few weak hadith, but when we say the Sahihain are authentic and agreed upon, what do we mean by this? What we mean by this is that the Rijal of the Sahihain, meaning the narrators of the two books of Hadith, Bukhari and Muslim, all the narrators are authentic narrators, but this does not mean from time to time there are a few sentences which they may make mistakes. Example, in the Sahih of Imam Muslim, Hamad bin Salama narrates from Thabit al-Bunani, from Sayyiduna Anas bin Malik radiallahu anh, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Inna abi wa abaka fin nar. Surely my father and your father are in the hellfire. The Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah reject the addition of Inna abi. They say this is the mistake of Hamad bin Salama, who made the mistake while reporting from Thabit al Bunani, because the narration from all the other students of Thabit al Bunani do not narrate Inna abi. They do not have Inna abi. So this is an example in the Sahih of Imam Muslim where a small addition of wording has been added by a narrator and the scholars pick up on these wordings. Therefore, when it comes to the discussion of Fadak, if people quote the passage which states a Sayyida Fatima radiallahu anha was angry with Sayyiduna Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anha and did not talk to him until she passed away, this addition was added by a Zuhri and this is known as Al-Idraj. So this is how Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah investigate their books and determine which sentences were added by narrators and which were said actually by the companions alayhim ridwan. When we make a comparison of the foundational books of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah and the four books of the Shia, we note that the late coming, the Shia who came in the 8th century, they started the process of weakening and authenticating hadith. Prior to the 8th century, the Shia sect did not have authentication. They had the four main books, Al Usul Al Arba'a, which were copied from Al Usul Al Arba'u Mia, which were, they claimed that there are 400 books of the Al Al Bayt which were written down, and from the 400 books of the Al Al Bayt, the four books of the Shia were, were formulated, which are Man la yahduru al faqihu al istibsaru tahdeeb al ahkam and the book of Al Kafi, which consists of Usul al Kafi, Furu al Kafi, and Rawda al Kafi by Muhammad bin Yaqub al Kulaini. These four books were not authenticated until the 800. Now, surprisingly, until Abu al Abbas Ahmad bin Taymiyyah wrote a refutation of the leading Shia scholar of that time in his book Minhaj al-Sunnah. Prior to that, they did not have verification and authentication. From that time, they started to categorize their hadith into five categories, which consisted of Sahih, Hassan, Muwathaq, Ba'if, and a fifth category. Then they began to, to divide their hadith. They ended up declaring over, four, over 9,000 Hadith in Usul al Kafi as being weak. Now, Usul al Kafi consists of over 16,000 Hadith. So, from 16,000 Hadith, they declared 9,000 as being weak. So, this is why if you quote Furu al Kafi to a person from the Shia community today, they will say that in the commentaries, in the commentaries of Farul Kafi, which were written after the 800s or were written after the 1000s, in those commentaries, our scholars have declared those hadith as being weak. 
So they say when you quote, when we quote Sahih al-Bukhari to you, your scholars have said that the book of Sahih al-Bukhari is, is authentic, 100% authentic. But like I explained to you before, that there are sentences or wordings in Sahih al-Bukhari that our scholars have pinpointed that these are additional wordings of narrators and they have made a mistake. What do we mean by those hadiths being Sahih? What we mean is that the narrators are all trustworthy. Even though the odd narrator may have a memory lapse, the odd narrator may make a mistake or perform idraj. Now Zuhri, who is known to have narrated the hadith of Fadak from, uh, by the way, of Sayyida Aisha radiallahu anha, Zuhri is known to do idraj. What do we mean by idraj? Adding word, words into the hadith to, in order to explain the hadith. For instance, the hadith in Kitabu Bad al Wahi in the Sahih of Imam al Bukhari, where uh, Sayyida Aisha radiallahu anha states that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would go to the cave and yet the wording used is yatahannath. In order to explain yatahannath, the narrator says wa huwa ta'abud, it is worship. Now when this wording of huwa ta'abud is added, is a Sayyida Aisha radiallahu anha saying this or is the sub-narrator saying this? The answer is that the sub-narrator Az-Zuhri is saying this. Now what tends to happen in polemics that the Shia sect tend to pick and choose from Sunni works and in many cases they may choose Id Idraj, the additional wording of a sub-narrator who may have made the mistake of adding that word. And this is where the wording of a Sayyida uh, Fatima radiallahu anha was angry comes from. So when we do a comparison of the works of the Shia and the Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah, if we do a comparison of Sahih al-Bukhari and Faru al-Kafi or uh, Usul al-Kafi, so here we have the work of Muhammad bin Yaqub al-Kulayni, which consists of Usul al-Kafi, which discusses Aqaid beliefs. We have Furu' al-Kafi and Rawdat al-Kafi, which discusses uh, subsidiary issues of fiqh. When we analyze these books, Sunni scholars also find passages which are objectionable in the Shia work. So you can note here that I've noted uh, many passages within uh, uh, Usul al-Kafi. For instance, where it mentions insults on the Prophet wassalam. But when we quote this, we would have to quote this in a scholarly fashion. If someone, in order to win the debate, just quotes this and says, you believe in this, and the Shia cleric responds by saying, actually our scholars have declared this hadith as being weak. In that case, then we must debate the verification method amongst the Shia sect. We cannot be unfair. So if the Shia is from the Akhbari type Shia, they accept Al-Usul Al-Arba'a without investigation. But if they are from Usuli Shia, they investigate the authentication and weakness of the Ahadith. So we would have to accept their conditions. But if you quote haphazardly from the Shia books or haphazardly from the Sunni books, this is not a scholarly methodology. You would have to be able to go into the books of Asma'ul Rijal. For instance, here we have the, one of the books of Asma'ul Rijal within the Shia school, which is known as Rijal Kashi, which is a famous book. I have it here somewhere with me. Within uh, this work, Rijal Kashi, the, what do the Shia scholars do? They note down the biography of each narrator. But even within the Asma'ul Rijal, which Allah Yari said, I will debate on Asma'ul Rijal. Remember, even within Asma'ul Rijal, not all the narrators are accounted for within the four books of the Shia. Unlike the Siha Sitta of the Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah, the biographies of the overwhelming majority of the narrators are found in the, for the Siha Sitta. But within the Shia works, we find Majahil, unknown narrators. Therefore, when we do a comparison of Asma'ul Rijal and the method of authentication amongst Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah and the Shia, we find disparity between, the, uh, between both methods. So this is very important because when they quote our books, they are unfamiliar with how the Asma'ul Rijal authentication and uh, weakening process works. 
But when we quote their books, we use a methodology. If the Shia say that our scholars have declared the hadith weak, they only start declaring those hadith weak in the 700s. Prior to the 700s, they would consider whatever is found in Al-Usul Al-Arba'a as authentic. This is why you find many of their scholars accepting the narrations of Tahrif Al-Quran. So when it comes to Tahrif Al-Quran, the, the tampering with the Quran, they say to us that in your books like Ad-Durr Al-Manthur and Al-Itqan Fi Ulum Al-Quran of Imam Jalaluddin Abdul Rahman Al-Suyuti, we find uh, narrations which mention tampering with the Quran. But a small note, every narration you will find in Al-Itqan Fi Ulum Al-Quran or Ad-Durr Al-Manthur, what year did Imam Jalaluddin pass away in? In the year 911. Every narration you will find in Ad-Durr Al-Manthur and in Al-Itqan Fi Ulum Al-Quran will either refer to Qiraat, the different methods of recitation, or it will refer to Naskh, abrogation in the Quran, or it will be without chain, or it will be very weak. All the narrations in the Sunni works which people tend, uh, uh, attempt to say that the Quran was tampered will in reality refer to Qiraat, how to recite, or they will refer to nasq abrogation, or they will refer, uh, or they will have no chain of narration, or if they have a chain of narration, the chain of narration will be extremely weak. But within the sources of uh, the uh, Shia, like in Tafsir Safi, which we have here, Tafsir, uh, tafsir Safi of Al Kashani. Al Kashani passed away uh, in the year 1091. So here in his sixth. Uh, Muqaddimah to the uh, Qur'an, tafsir that he wrote, commentary to the Qur'an. He narrates these narrations, but when he narrates these narrations, he accepts Tahrif al-Qur'an as a concept. As you can note, I've highlighted the passages. So, when he accepts Tahrif al-Qur'an, what makes the difference between him and Jalaluddin al-Suyuti, rahimullah? In Ad-Dur al-Manthur, if you check Ad-Dur al-Manthur, Al-Imam Jalaluddin al-Suyuti rahmullah Sunni scholar in the same time, he says, I only compile this for verification. So people will know these narrations, not because he believes in these narrations. And in his Al-Itqan fi Ulum al-Quran, this work, Al-Itqan fi Ulum al-Quran, he refutes the concept of Tahrif al-Quran. But the difference here is that Al-Kashani, he, Al-Kashani mentions the two positions of the Twelver School. One position is that Tahrif al-Qur'an did not take place. The second position is Tahrif al-Qur'an did take place, and that is the position Al-Kashani takes. When Al-Kashani takes this position, we would ask the Twelve sect, why do you not declare him as a disbeliever? So this is the first principal difference between Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah and the Shia, that we declare anyone who believes in Tahrif al-Qur'an as a kafir. They do not declare those Shia clerics who, de- who believe in the tampering of the Qur'an as kafir. Now, the official opinion from Iran is that the Qur'an is not tampered. But they do not declare those clerics who believe in the tampering of the Qur'an like the author of Faslul Khitab or this Tafsir al-Safi and other works of the Shia. They have written uh, certain works in Lebanon where they condemn the, the concept of tampering of the Quran. This is where the discussion moves on to taqiyah and other issues. But Make sure. uh, there, there is a one final point, which uh, a few, two or three points, which we would want to mention is number one, which that when the Shia tend to mention the definition of a Sahabi, some of the laymen tend to think that the Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah believe the Sahaba are ma'soom. Sahaba are free from sin. This is not the position of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah. The position of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah is all the companions are udul, which means upright. What does this mean? This means that they did not forge hadith in the name of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What is the greatest evidence or proof for this? The Battle of Sifin took place between Sayyiduna Ali Karamallahu Jawal Kareem and Amir Muawiyah radiallahu an. From the 110,000 companions, Ali Muridwan, only a few thousand took part in this. But there were thousands of companions on the side of Amir Muawiyah radiallahu an. 
including the brother of Sayyiduna Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu an. Aqil bin Abi Talib, who is the brother of Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an, was in the side of Amir Muawi radiallahu an. We would want to know the position of the 12 sect regarding Aqil bin Abi Talib. So when these companions had a war, how many of those companions on the side of Amir Muawiya forged a hadith? The answer is none. This alone proves the position of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah that the companions did not forge hadith in the name of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. One final point, the final point of today's discussion is regarding Al-Imamatul Kubra that the main dispute between Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah and the Shia sect is that they believe that Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an being the successor of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is mansus min Allah which means stipulated by Allah Almighty. Ahl sunnati wal jama'ah deny this. Based on this foundational dispute, all the other disputes come out. Like Al-Isma, they believe the 12 Imams, the 12 Imams are all free from sin, meaning they cannot sin. And, and they mention Ayatul Tathir, even though Ayatul Tathir is regarding the wives also, but that's a part of the discussion. So they say they are all free from sin. But based on this, they also end up condemning other Imams of the Ahlul Bayt. For instance, we Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah love Al Imam Zaid bin Ali, radiallahu an, the, the brother of Al Imam Baqir. But the Shia sect, the 12 sect, unfortunately, do not have kind words to say regarding Al-Imam Zaid. We love Al-Imam Al-Baqir, radiallahu an. We love Al-Imam Zaid. We love Ab Abdullah Al-Mahad. Who is Abdullah Al-Mahad? Abdullah Al-Mahad, radiallahu an, is the first Sayyid to have Hassani and Husseini lineage. Abdullah Al-Mahad. He had a son called Al-Nafsu Zakiya, who was martyred by the Abbasis. We love them also. We love Al Imam Abdul Qadir Al Jilani radiallahu an. So Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah love all of these, but they say you have denied their love by denying Al Imama. Because you deny Al Imama and you deny Isma, you are also from the enemies of the Ahlul Bayt. This leads to their belief in Al Bada. I will quickly go through this list. Al Bada, Al Bada, what is the concept of Al Bada? That when Al Imam Ja'far al Sadiq radiallahu an had a son called Ismail, he declared Ismail radiallahu an as the Imam after him. Ismail radiallahu an passed away. After he passed away, the Shia went, the Shia at that time went to Imam Jafar Sadiq. This is according to their books. And they said, You declared Ismail as the Imam. Who is the Imam after you? And then he said, Musa al Kadhim is the Imam. It appeared for Allah as such, meaning this is Aqidatul Bada that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a judgment and then something appears for him to give the judgment contrary to the previous position. This concept in Shiaism is known as Al-Bada and is found in their works uh, like Al-Kafi. So this is a second principle uh, dispute amongst Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah. A third principle dispute is At-Taqiyah. Why do they do At-Taqiyah? Because of the danger that the Shia sect faced, they believed that at taqiyah within their books, Al-Kafi, it is mentioned that taqiyah is nine-tenths of faith, meaning to protect yourself. So this is another foundational uh, difference between Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah. A, a fourth main uh, contention is Mata'inu Sahaba, that they attacked the companions Ali Muridwan. You see, Ammar Naqshwani may have mentioned the uh, what attempted to disparage the shaykhain but the real contention is that they believe that the companions Ali Muridwan performed kufr disbelief when they rejected the imama of Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an so according to the the Shia if they mention Fadak or they mention uh, the, uh, the incident which we believe is a fabrication of uh, Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu an attacking the house waliyadu billah Sayyida Fatima radiallahu anha if they quote these fabrications and we can prove from their own books that they are fabrications like in al-ihtijaj we do not have time to quote this I was going to quote this if there was a debate today but this issue of attacking the Sahaba Ali Muridwan stems from the fact that they believe the companions committed disbelief from denying the Imam of Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anh. But Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah will say that none of these, the incident of breaking the door or burning the house didn't, did not take place. 
They are, they are all forgeries. And that Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu anh, actually gave bay'ah allegiance to Sayyiduna Abu Bakr Siddiq and was his, uh, con- he was the one who would advise Sayyiduna Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anh. So, mata'in ala alil bayt, that they also attack alul bayt. How do they attack alul bayt? What do they think of Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu anhuma? What do they think of Zayd bin Ali radiallahu an? What do they think of Aqil bin Abi, uh, Aqil bin Abi Talib, the son of Abu Talib? What, and some Shia tend to think that all Sunnis believe Abu Talib was a disbeliever. Remember, uh, Ahmad bin Zaini Dahlan, the Mufti of Mecca al mukarrama during the Ottoman rule, he gave a fatwa that Abu Talib was a Muslim. So this is not an agreed upon opinion of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah. Then number five and the final point is their disputes regarding Faru' Fiqhiyah. All the Fiqh disputes they have go back to al Imama. For instance, they believe Muta'a with women is permissible. Why did they say this? Because Sayyiduna Umar was the one who enforced the prohibition of muta'a. We, we believe the Prophet forbade muta'a. The instruction was enforced by Sayyiduna Umar but to contravene Sayyiduna Umar they, they allow muta'a. Or aklul himar, eating of donkey, domestic donkey meat. Or al jima' fi dubar, which is uh, we cannot translate that here, but they uh, allow that action also. So these, this is a quick summary of uh, the background to the Shia sect. One point is in Rijal Kashi, in Rijal Kashi, this book of Asma Rijal, which I found now. The, in this, Abdullah bin Sabah, Abdullah bin Sabah, the founder of uh, Shiaism, is mentioned as a real individual. So the Shia. Uh, people who are going to listen to this have a check in the Rijal Kashi. You will find that Abdullah bin Sabah is a, r- a real individual. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us to continue with the debate in a peaceful method. Uh, Final words I would like to thank the following individuals. I would like to thank Mawlana Ijaz Ahmed for making this event possible. He does many things behind the scenes which people are unaware of. He did so during the debate with Abdul Rahman Hassan also, and he was the main person involved in organizing this event. I would like to at, uh, uh, thank our brother, uh, Maulana Hafiz Saeed Makki, the son of Maulana Ghulam Rasul Chakswari, rahimullah ta'ala, for allowing this event in this center and for other uh, consultations, which uh, not everything can be mentioned here. And I would like to thank Brother Nuri from Slough who provided so many, uh, so much material and so many books to me in order that I may have uh, much of the books. Remember, uh, just a message to the Shia, I have your books. So I will be quoting your books in the debate. And we conclude this mehfal, uh, this gathering with dua from Someone from the Alul Bayt, from the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa barik wa sallim. Allahumma salli wa sallim ala Sayyidina Muhammadin. Salatu wa rajina bi abu jameel ahwari wa rafaat. Wa taqdilana bi abu jameel hajar. Wa tarfawna bi ayinda ka ala tanajar. Wa tuballiguna bi abu tarbayat. Min jameel khayrati fi lahayyati wa ba'dal mamar. Inna ka ala kulli shayin jadeed. Ya Rabbul Alameen, Aaj ki hadri, Aaj ki hai aapko apne hadri manzuru manzuru sabhur samma. Aaj Aaj ki aapko ki kaktaan ke liye, aapko kusun tak pohchane ke liye, sachai ko kusun tak pohchane ke liye, yaha is masjid ke andar ek program sajaya gaya, banaya gaya. جتنے بھی احباب آئے ہیں اللہ باقی سب گانا قبول فرما ہمارے شیخ سرا رشید صاحب کو اللہ دین کے اندر مزید استقامت کامیابیاں اور کامرانی عطا فرما ہر مقام کا جہاں بھی حق کو لے کے جائے حق کے لیے جائے معاہنے خطا اور نصرت عطا فرما جہاں بھی حق کے لیے جائے حق کو پہچانے کے لیے حق کی پہچان کے لیے جہاں بھی جائیں اللہ انہیں فضا و نصرت اور کامیابی آتا فرما اور دین کی سربلندی کے لیے انہیں کوششیں اور ساکشیں مزید کرنے کی توفیق عطا فرما ان کی جوانی میں علم میں عمر میں برکتیں رحمتیں مجھتیں عطا فرما مولانا غلام رسول صاحب جنہوں نے یہ اس مسجد کو بنایا ان کو جوار رحمت میں جگہ عطا فرما ان کی توبر کو سلام در روشن اور منظر فرما ان کے بیٹے جو اس ادارے کو چلا رہے ہیں صحیح صاحب اور ان کے بھائی لائن میں استقامت و سلام
دے عطا فرما دیگر جتنے بھی احباب یہاں اس محفل میں آئے ہیں اللہ ان سفر کرم و فضل فرما دین دین سیکھنے سمجھنے کی توفیق عطا فرما بن اللہ و نعم الوکیل نعم المولا و نعم النصیر و صلی اللہ تعالیٰ علیہ وسلم سیدنا محمد